everyone. Um, long time no see. Sorry about that. Um, sometimes my own life intervenes. <laughs> I, can't, I just either can't um, find the time or the or the will. It's not. It's um. I don't know. I. It's um. Let me put it this way. I'm not the kind of person who needs to be on camera <laughs> and needs attention. I'm really not. Um, and I, um, sometimes I'm like, oh, I just can't, I can't deal with it today. Does that make sense? Um, not that you guys aren't lovely. You're all quite lovely. But um, sometimes I, I feel emotionally up for it. And sometimes I'm just like, blech. And I also feel that we've reached the point in um, coronavirus time when um, we're all just really sick of it. <laughs> At least I am. So, um, got scotch. No, it's like, what time is it? It's it's uh, like one in the afternoon. No scotch yet. Um, I'll get there. But I think I've reached the point in um, coronavirus time when... I'm just kind of done with it and uh, kind of going through life in a in a stupor and getting sick of it. The novelty has certainly worn off and my coping skills of of, of dealing with this with resilience have, have worn off and I'm kind of getting annoyed of eating chickpeas. <laughs> so, um, you know, I can I can make my coronavirus beans. I'm, I now know how to make beans and I'm like, ugh, beans. So, um, I suspect that a lot of us feel the same way. So just know that that was me for the last, you know, four days, something like that. And that's my, my absence. So, um, hey, Nadia, how you doing? Houston, that's where I grew up, Houston, Texas. Um, first time I saw it mentioned in a movie was in Superman 2 when they said Planet Houston. We all thought that was very funny. Um Irritable, yes. Oh, we all need to redirect. I also realized, and I talked to my husband about this, um, how much standing and walking in a daily um, fashion was good for my body. And, you know, just parking in the parking garage at, on a campus, which is blocks away from your building, and you have to walk, and being late for a meeting and having to hustle it down the hall, and standing and lecturing for hours during a week. That is... it. it it reminds me, Remy pointed this out, that it's like the guys in the space station that have to work out for four hours a day. And they do, they work out for four hours a day and they still lose body mass because they don't have gravity. And all of us just um, sitting in our chairs and especially somebody like me who's on Zoom meetings all day um, and I'm not standing anymore. I need to get a standing desk. So I'm gonna look into what I can do there because I'm sitting too much and my... Um, I just need to move more. So yesterday I took two walks, which is good, but now I'm behind because I should have done more reading, but I can't, I can't read and walk at the same time. I could try, trust me, I could try, but that, I, that would be bad. <laughs> I would run into people and, and other things. So, um, but the last time we talked, um, we talked about race in ancient Egypt and how it is uh, misrepresented by Egyptologists, how it is claimed by Egyptologists. And I was there with my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Winterman, and he had some, some things that were of interest. We didn't talk about uh, in the same 2005 our magazine that was there to support the, the exhibition that opened at the LA County Museum of Art um, in two, um, for Tutankhamen, the Tutankhamen treasures, that they did a recreation and put that recreation on the cover, the one that looks like Barbara Streisand, the one that's um, got a super white face and that there was a huge outcry. And at LACMA at the museum, when the exhibition opened, because this uh, reconstruction was on display for the first couple of weeks, we had people picketing, people of color picketing the museum saying, King Tut is back and he's black. Um, and lest you think that I'm saying that this is overkill, it's absolutely not. It's, uh, that was a total white claim of people of color and all of their power and their gold. And it was a whitewashing of an ancient Egyptian reality. So um, I actually still proudly have my t-shirt, King Tut is back and he's black. Um, and I learned more about race appropriation, ethnic appropriation, 
um, during that time period when I was co-curated at LACMA in 2005 than any other, um, even arguably more than when I taught at Howard University for a year in 1999, um, 2000. So that that's, um, it's interesting to ask why there are all of these claims of the ancient Egyptians, but you know, what, what I'd like to do um, today right now is to think a little bit more about the ethnicity of the ancient Egyptians from a more emic perspective. Um, see what we can what we can do with that. That's an interesting way to go. Um, I will I will say that when people ask me what race were the ancient Egyptians, and you heard me and Jonathan um, talking last time, uh, saying that race is a socially constructed concept. It's not something we can really use, um, but it's it's um, if we use the term ethnicity, okay, fine. But let me put it this way. If you need to choose and you need to identify and you need to understand what it would be today, why do you need to do that? But that's interesting. Um, and I need to do it too. I think a lot of us need to understand how light the people were, how dark the people were, how they represented themselves. I would encourage all of you to look at the so-called mannequin of Tutankhamun from his tomb and look at the the dark skin color that's that's used for his own face, um, an understanding of ethnicity from the Egyptian side, certainly without all of the complications of chattel slavery from Africa and a much more um, white versus black, literally, understanding of power and in economy and, and colonialism. Um, but if I have to pick a race, whatever that is, or an ethnicity of the ancient Egyptians, I would call them people of color. And for an American audience, I would say that if they were in Alabama in 1955, they would have had to sit at the back of the bus. That's the best way for, for me to describe it. The, and if you if you doubt me and you're like, no, no, they were white and this and that, well, then Google people of Luxor, modern people of Luxor, and look at the, the skin colors of the people of modern day Luxor of Upper Egypt, people of Minya, um, wh whatever it is you, you want to, to put in there, but to get an understanding of, of uh, the skin color of the modern day Egyptians, I think is very helpful. Um, make no mistake, Egypt is always has always been a part of three different cultural slash ethnic worlds. It is in Africa. It is in Northern Africa. It's in Northeastern Africa. So it is a part of the Mediterranean world um, connected to those Northern um, streams of people. It is connected to a West Asian world and, a, and Levantine peoples. And it is connected to a Nubian world down to the South. So all of these three streams are and still moving in and out of Egypt. So you can see in Egypt some people with very light skin and some people with very dark skin. And all of these things work on a gradient. Yes, they are all socially constructed. But the idea that, and I see this in um, discussions all the time, um, particularly on my page when I post something about race, somebody will pop up and say, the Egyptians were European or the Egyptians were West Asian or the Egyptians were white. The Egyptians weren't sub-Saharan African. And there seems to be a great deal of personal identity interest in claiming the Egyptians and their power and their gold and their success and their pyramids and all their stuff and claiming it for themselves. Um, appropriations of all kinds. And those appropriations can be seen amongst Europeans and the the bust of Nefertiti, who was probably a proud Theban woman of color, um, taken to Berlin, and then she's put on postage stamps, and you Google the postage stamps of the last um, hundred years with Nefertiti on it, and they are literally whitewashed, and that brown skin is, is very much taken away so that everyone can claim Nefertiti. That's pretty interesting. Um, that, that Tut recreation from the 2005 LACMA show, the whitest uh, European-like skin you could possibly imagine. Even that recreation of Tut that shows him as a deformed product of incest, same um, uh, whitish uh, European with a tan <laughs> kind of skin. Um, and then there's appropriations from the other side. So there's an Afrocentrist um, perspective that you have to claim it and then you get a darker skin color applied to the ancient Egyptians than they necessarily had. And there's an attempt to claim Egypt as a, a tool of power 
for sub-Saharan communities. Um, it works the same way. So, and Egypt doesn't want to fit into either, which is pretty interesting because the, they're there on the crossroads between the sub-Saharan world and between the West Asian, um, European, Mediterranean world, and they are North African. And the study that I like to go to the most, this is a study from um, about five years ago, and I'll, I'll Google it and put it in the um, notes, but it's a National Geographic study that did a it looked at the DNA of the current population of Egypt, um, sampling that population. Obviously, they're not doing DNA of every single person in Egypt, but doing a sampling and comparing it to other parts of Africa, West Asia, and Europe. And it's amazing that that population in Egypt is not Arab. Um, Arab invasion of Egypt in the seventh century was an elite replacement, not a replacement of the entire population, only a replacement of maybe the top 5% of the population. And the people in Egypt today are North African and they share a genetic um, similarities with uh, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco. This is what the people of Egypt are most connected to, which which should make sense, right? Um, there has been extraordinary misuse of genetic studies and the one that's the most egregious and the press picked up on um, the quickest was this uh, German study that took a series, that did DNA um, analysis on a series of mummies found in an Eastern Delta site that they happened to have in the museum because otherwise the Egyptians wouldn't have allowed this study with such a small sample and from one particular place that's not going to tell you much of anything at all. And this German study released that the ancient Egyptians were Levantine. <laughs> well, of course, these people in the in the in the Delta, this this small population um, in the Delta showed Levantine West Asian genetic traits and sim similarities to the, that population, because there's always been a connection between Levantine and Egyptian peoples through the Delta, particularly the Eastern Delta. So no surprise there. Um, but the way it was picked up by the press and the way it was misused by the academics themselves, and again, I'll look for this one and post it too, is um, was quite problematic because then you had all of these people saying that um, the Egyptians are, are, um, are not even Egyptian at all, they're West Asian, and, and that, took a, that, that was um, gutting for the people of Egypt and quite misused. And you can imagine how that was also appropriated by um, some people in Israel with an Israel. There, there's also such genetic studies. Oh, there was the other one. I'm sorry, I'm mixing up genetic studies. But do you guys remember the genetic study talking about the Palestinians associating them with uh, European uh, genetic traits going back to the Bronze Age collapse and that you have the movement of the Sea Peoples um, into West Asia, settling there on the coast of the Levant. And then you have the press release saying that the Palestinians are actually Europeans. And then you had some Israelis then using that politically to say that the Palestinians were their second and the Israelis were their first and da, 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 da. So please, I mean, these genetic studies can be so misused and so misunderstood and willfully misunderstood and never think that archaeology is not political. It is one of the most political sciences, social sciences that exist. Um, archaeology can be used to support nationalism. It can be used to support ethnic appropriation. It can be used to support colonialism. It's often used as a way of saying we got here first or we identify with these people and to to make a, a genetic connection or a cultural connection, um, these things can be can be very very problematic. Um, so those are some of my thoughts about um, the the scholarly use and and misuse of um, genetic studies. Genetic studies in and of themselves are problematic. Um, and there's a really good trade book on the subject um, that I'll also post in the in the comments about um, modern genetic studies of ancient data sets, how you extract the DNA, how um, you have to plug in the holes of that DNA because it's going to be very fragmented, how contaminated that DNA can get with um, modern DNA around it. 
and you might be testing um, who the, the sampler's DNA instead of the ancient DNA. It's um, quite complicated. When I, I'm not a geneticist, I don't I don't do this stuff. But when I talk to people who um, study this material, there are some people who say you can't do uh, DNA analysis with ancient materials. It cannot be done yet. We don't have the science. Other people who say, oh no, there's so much that we can learn. Um, I, I will continue to listen to the experts and watch them fight before I make any uh, conclusions myself. Um, but I have to grapple with these things myself in my own trade books because this DNA evidence is uh, used a great deal to make to make certain claims about in the 18th dynasty who's the product of incest who was related to whom and how things work um yeah lots of conclusions uh can be made um what about the libyan 22nd dynasty oh my goodness um the, this is uh, complicated after the Bronze Age collapse or during the Bronze Age collapse, you have the incursions of so many different peoples into Egypt. You have a mass migration uh, on a scale that the world had arguably never seen um, with people coming from the northern parts of the Mediterranean and sweeping around east, settling in Anatolia, the Levant, um, trying to get into Egypt, being repelled multiple times. Um, but then settling in the Delta anyway and settling in large numbers in Libya and then moving into Egypt from Libya. And in fact, the Libu, um, where modern day Libya may indeed get its name, could come from one of these Sea People's tribes, um, the Libu, the Libyans. So do we understand Libyans as North African or do we understand them as European Greek even? Um, how far does your genetic strain go? It's the same way when you do a genetic test with 23andMe or National Geographic or um, whatever company you end up using. Um, what's the other one? Ancestry, right? Those are our big three. It de they make the choice of how far they wanna put those genetics back, right? If you were, say, somebody from Florence and you wanted to trace your genetics all the way back to the Bronze Age, then you would probably find, and studies have shown, that you have connections to West Asian peoples. And there is indeed a mythology, an origination mythology of the Etruscans having Semitic origins and coming from, from abroad. Um, and studies have been done that show that if you push that genetics that genetic material back thousands of years, you can make connections between people of West Asia from certain areas and the Etruscans. Um, but that doesn't mean that if you're a Florentine Italian and you go to 23andMe and you get your genetics done, that they're gonna say you're West Asian because their tests don't go back that far. And they're comparing you to the population there now and they all have that, <laughs> or many of them have that Etruscan origin, but they've been there for so long that they now count as Italian whatever that is. So these genetic tests are constantly deciding what counts as what. So, you know, in my genetic test from my, from my mother's side, I found out recently that she's 10% North African, Coptic even. So I have some Egyptian, some Coptic Egyptian, um, uh, North African, you know, a little 5%, but that's cool to find the Egyptologist to find out that she's, um, ancient Egyptian in origin, tiny little part of me, that's awesome. Um, but but does that mean that all Italians are, I mean, how far does that North African go back? It's probably pretty recent. It's probably within um, the past uh, couple hundred years and not much further. And tracking DNA over farther stretches of time can be quite problematic. Now, again, you can tell <laughs> that I'm not a geneticist and I don't pretend to be one. Um, but I am interested in how people use and abuse um, ethnic, racial, nationalist identity by using these genetic markers, which brings, oh, and then somebody asked me about the Libyans. So, you know, the Libyans, um, I haven't seen any genetic tests or mummy tests or anything like that that has been done on the high priesthood of Amun. You could do it. You could go to the the high priest and general Masaharta, Libyan name, and you could do a genetic study on his molar and see what uh, communities, modern communities best connect to that high priest of Amun's genetic makeup. 
I would be interested in seeing such a study. However, I worry about such a study being misused, um, mishandled, and people saying, oh, the people of Thebes are really northern and, and or making some kind of a north-south um, divide between them. So these things are fraught. These things are third rail type discussions. They are um, hot. And identity is something that today and in the ancient world was always quite malleable, quite um, flexible. You could come into Egypt as a Nubian, like um, the bodyguard of, of Hatshepsut, my Herpri, comes in from the south from Nubia and he Egyptianizes and he becomes an Egyptian elite. Or you could come in as a Libu and, or a chief of Ma, and you could come in and become the high priest of Amen and general Harihor and Egyptianize, speak Egyptian, depict yourself as an Egyptian, and then your ethnic identity is what you choose to show um, through your name, calling yourself a chief of Ma, something like that. But you could decide that you don't want to show any of that ethnic identity. Give yourself a name like Amenhotep, Hide it. Amen is at peace. Very Egyptian name. Don't talk about the ethnic identity and then what are we to know? And then there's an understanding that maybe you have, have something you want to hide or maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you can, you can move along um, into a different identity association. Um, these things are fraught for us today too. So if you, if you think about all of the complications of what it means to be Mexican-American and who's um, considered, you know, who's a Mexican-American who grew up speaking Spanish, who's second or third generation who doesn't speak Spanish anymore. The fact that you're even speaking Spanish and not a Native American language is interesting in and of itself, right? Um, there's already been a colonial identification, um, many steps removed, so that very few people um, speak Azteca um, when, when they come here or some other Native language. Those languages still exist, but um, anybody who wants to move into power circles in Mexico needs to be speaking Spanish and not these other languages. Um, so for the, the ancient Egyptians, um, you don't have these lighter is good and darker is bad and skin color type associations. The Egyptians are in the middle of the spectrum. They are just as xenophobic in their history as anybody else. They stereotype other ethnicities and races, create races just like anybody else. And their three traditional enemies are the Libyans to the northwest, the Asiatics to the northeast, both of them depicted with lighter yellowish skin compared to them. And then the Nubians to the south, the Kushites, um, people of Kerma, if you like, with a much darker skin. And different physiological facial traits are given to these stereotyped images in the most xenophobic depictions. And the Egyptians are there in the middle of, of all of this. Um, it's, it's, a, it's not a white versus black sort of simple understanding, which we still associate with power. The lighter is associated with the powerful and the darker is associated with less power. Um, even in the United States, we have a bunch of white women who tan and go to tanning salons or put on fake tanner. Um, that's an, a, an attempt. I don't know. It's a way of saying that we're so white, we don't need to be white <laughs> anymore. But then if you go to a place like um, South Korea, uh, you have people that use bleaching creams or Mexico or Egypt um, who use bleaching creams to try to get as white as possible because there is great power to be had in having whiter skin. Um, and some of those bleaching creams are very dangerous uh, to the, the face, contain lead and other things. What is it called? Um, Fair and Lovely, I think, is the name of this uh, notorious skin cream that works, but is very detrimental to a person's health. Um, but one thing, I, I'm not going to say that the Egyptians, even though they're in the middle of their three traditional enemies, were above racial stereotyping or skin color ID amongst their own people. I suspect they did it, but it's hard for us to get at. And the reason I suspect they did it is because ancient Egypt is always a competition between North and South. And I see this regional competition more clearly now than I did when I was a younger graduate student. And I think I see it more clearly now because we're living in such a time in the United States. It's very much a North versus South, 
city versus province um, kind of situation, red versus blue, however you want to see it. But the civil war never died in this country. And the civil war never died in Egypt, arguably. Whenever things got tough in Egypt, the country would split apart into two. The Delta would go its way and the Nile Valley would go its way to be ruled by different polities. Sometimes the Delta would break up into more than one warlord or ruler. Um, because it's a big expanse and harder to unify, the Nile Valley would often break apart along its length. But those two are very much in competition with one another. And you can see that competition. Sometimes they'll let us see it. Like at the beginning of the 12th dynasty, when Amenemhet I takes the kingship, ostensibly in a coup, moves to a new capital called Amenemhet has seized the two lands. Damn, that's a throwdown of a capital name. And then gets assassinated, arguably, um, at, towards you know a couple decades into his reign. And by whom was he assassinated? How did this work? Is he assassinated by um, fellow Southerners? Or is it when he moved his capital city north that people, those entrenched elites of the north, then took him out? And this is a byproduct of north-south aggression against each other. The kind of hatred, these regional differences, they run deep. Um, just Let's just put somebody from New York in a room together with somebody from Alabama and see how that conversation <laughs> goes down, right? These differences run very, very deep. The word Yankee is still um, thrown about um, where I grew up in Texas with abandon. Another example is the murder of Ramses III. Ramses III goes down to his harem palace in Thebes, is hanging out with the ladies, and it is there in Thebes that he is murdered. And that's, um, I think, another sign of this aggression. In some ways, a deep-seated distrust between elites from the north and south against each other. And you see that in ancient Egypt. Was this reified, however, in skin color differences? Was this something where people thought, oh, those Northerners, those those Levantines, those Ramesids from the Delta are coming down to Thebes, those white-skinned people. We don't see this overtly, but I wouldn't be surprised because humans are assholes. <laughs> this is the way they think. And they identify people on site as foreigner. You're with us, you're against us, you belong, you don't. And I wouldn't be surprised if you had a, a Theban understanding of Northerners that included a skin color. Um, if anyone knows of such a reference in Egyptian text, do let me know because that would be of great interest. I haven't seen it myself. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess I'm going to end with saying that people are people. <laughs> Instead of like saying people are a-holes again. People are people. Um, they, they like to choose the people that, that they identify with that, and they do so um physiognomically they do so um through skin color through understandings of who even looks like me um these things can be transcended we all know these things can be transcended especially those of us who live in in cities with many different populations coming together the more homogenous a place is the more likely it is potentially to be xenophobic and rejecting of the other um Ancient Egypt was not above this. They were they were involved in this like anybody else. Um, their skin colors were different from one another from north to south. They had um, distrust of one another that was likely reified in these physical terms. Um, and again, I come down to the point that, um, like uh, Us Magazine says, ancient Egyptians, they're just like us. <laughs> we're not that different. Um, and so that's where I'll end it today. Let's see what kinds of discussions this brings up. Whenever I talk about race, things blow up. So, um, so this should be fun. And um, let's see, let everyone try to behave and uh, be kind and understand how race and skin color is used as a, a tool of power and exploitation and dehumanizing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, till next time, and um, I'll try not to be too lumpy and depressed and, and be on the, the Facebook Live more often. Okay, take care, you guys. Bye.